is Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. everyone and welcome to the Harold Davis Studio in Berkeley, California. We are so pleased to have you with us today. Today's webinar is creating artist books and portfolios. Using Harold's successful Kickstarter projects Botanique, an artist book, Monochromatic Visions, a portfolio of prints, and the Kamano Koto project as case studies, this webinar explains the process of creating artist books and portfolios. The discussion will start with the philosophic. What makes a good artist book or portfolio project? How are visual cohesion and a theme maintained? Then we'll take a look at materials. This is a large topic by itself and includes issues of printing and imposition, presentation, binding, suppliers, and more. Finally, we'll take a look at pricing and marketing opportunities for these very special one-off or limited edition creations. Many of you know who Harold Davis is, but if you're joining us for the first time today, here's a bit about Harold. Harold Davis is an artist, photographer, and author. His most recent books include Creative Black and White Second Edition and Creative Garden Photography, both published by Rocky Nook. Harold is the developer of a unique technique for photographing flowers for transparency and an innovator of digital multi-raw processing and hand HDR processing. Harold is an internationally known photographer. His prints are widely collected and he is a sought after workshop leader. He is a Moab master and a Zeiss ambassador. Harold's website is digitalfieldguide.com. Now I'm going to stop my share and hand it over to Harold. Hi, everyone. I, I'm really happy to be here today and happy, happy to be here with you all. And as we've been saying, we've got a complicated and exciting uh, presentation for you today with a, a, a number of different parts. What I'm first going to do is I'm going to show a presentation, a slideshow myself. Then we're going to break for a couple of movies and four movies to be precise. And then we're going to um, open up a discussion about some of the issues raised. Really the overall broader topic here is how you turn individual pieces of photography or art into something that's an artist book. And the emphasis is going to be on something that one can do with one's own printers and own hands rather than sending it off to a printer in China or someplace to make a published book. Or, and, and we're really not gonna talk about uh, things like blurb books today. That's really a different topic. This is about handmade books and portfolios. And then from a couple of aspects, how you can do that to show your own work at the with the best foot forward and then also how you can use the pieces to make a unique work of art that's different and beyond the individual uh, component parts of it. So in keeping with that uh, that theme, how you take the parts and make, make something out of it, what I'm going to show in my work to start with are most of the pieces of three different uh, art portfolio and artist book projects that we've done. Uh, one of them is called Botanique, which was uh, basically about botanical art. One of them is called Monochromatic Visions and it's a portfolio of my, some of my black and white work. And um, one of them is called the Kimono Kodo portfolio and it's about the work I did on a pilgrimage it took on the Kimono Koto Trail in Japan a number of years ago. So all of these projects have in common, as you'll see, that they've been they've been commercial in the sense that they are art and that collectors have bought a number of copies of these. So, and they're also laborious and a labor of love. Those are fair statements. So with that said, I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see, you should all be seeing a title slide at this point. 
what I want to try to encourage people to do as we go along is I want to encourage people to ask questions in the box, please. As Phyllis said, we've put a lot of thought into the suppliers and things like that that we're going to hear. And um, we want to hear from you. So this is my latest published book from Rocky Nook, Creative Garden Photography. I've got a discount code for it from the publisher at the end of my presentation. For us, the process of putting together a book like Creative Garden Photography is a lot like putting together an artist book. In other words, these are an expression of my artistic intent in collaboration with my wonderful graphic designer, namely Phyllis. And you can see, by the way, on the green screen behind me, some of the signature pages from this very book. So putting something like this together is, a, is, is an act of personal artistic creation, but it does employ a technology that's beyond what we can do in, our, in, the, uh, in the privacy of our own homes, namely a uh, fairly elaborate uh, Photoshop pre-flighting technology, graphic designers, press, big presses, massive numbers of copies, and a kind of an industrial effort, which, you know, you know, the publisher typically has a fair amount of money riding on each of their, each of their front list books. And it's just a different uh, universe than what we're about to talk about in this presentation. So in terms of the kind of content that I would like to give information to you about in here, here's a, um, a topic list, an agenda. We're going to come back to this agenda at the end of the presentation and, and kind of open a sort of discussion about this and ask you for both um, source of places where you need sources and also uh, any ideas you have as well or any questions that are not on this list. But one of the topics I want to talk about is how you edit. Once you get to a situation where you're not just dealing with a single uh, image, but a series of images around a project, around a hike on the Kamonokoto or around a visit to a garden, uh, how do you edit that? How many pieces should be in a uh, in, in a collection of photos for this kind of thing? It's just a different sense that that some images might have to be there that have a supporting informational role and are not the A level images, perhaps. In any case, there are a whole range of questions around how you edit for this kind of project, how you construct it. Now. This is, a, this is a very interesting topic when it co comes to something like an artist book. You know, in a few years back, uh, Phyllis and I went to a trade show for artist books. That was what was there. And we saw a lot of interesting things, but most of them were about the object itself, not about the artwork that made up the object. So for me, when I do an artist book, I want the photography in it, the art in the book to be well situated and well and well framed, as well as have a unique and interesting object. But the two goals don't necessarily go together. And it's a it's a neat trick to pull off both of them, to have beautiful work in a unique um, kind of packaging that also works with it. Collateral material. So Almost every kind of artist book or portfolio that is being presented as art needs collateral material, perhaps fly leaves, perhaps some kind of printed material about what it is. Uh, you know, if you go back to classical portfolios like the ones Edward Weston did, there's always something that's been printed up about it or the Ansel Adams portfolios. And it's important that that be nicely designed. We'll talk about it. So. How do you print this? What kind of paper should you use? How do you bind it? If this is something that is going to be marketed into the art world, uh, what, how are you going to handle additions and additioning? And let's talk about marketing generally. Then perhaps you don't really care about marketing. Perhaps 
marketing as an art object, perhaps you want to use it to show off your work. That's a different and perfectly fine goal, but it's a little bit different than making something that's an object that can be collected and sold. So without further ado, here's Botanique and many of the pieces that made up Botanique. A camellia, kiss from a rose is what I've called this. It's uh, my image that's widely attributed to Georgia O'Keeffe, but it's actually my photograph. Poppy, and the same pop over close up. And a lot of these are light box compositions, but certainly not all of them. And here's a uh, peonies panorama, as you'll see in the book itself, in the, um, it's a pullout where one of, one of three pullouts in the book where actually the piece itself is folded over and pulled out. I have a question, a wonderful question from Mark Miller, and I'm going to address it before I go further because it's, let's get definitions out of the way. Uh, so um, he asked me to define artist book and portfolio and perhaps also compare and contrast what are the uh, differences between them. Thanks, Mark. Um, I should have started with that, perhaps. Generally speaking, both are personal statements by an artist or photographer. So these are not commercial in the sense of uh, mass produced books, and then generally they're not mass produced. A portfolio is a collection of prints. Usually they're loose and not bound. Um, often they're in a specific container or box. Sometimes they're marketed with a extra print that the collector can hang as well as the loose prints in the box. But it's a nice way for a collector to have a sequence of prints from a single artist because that way it's fairly easy to store them. Instead of framing 12 prints, you've got 12 prints in a nice museum box where they're archival, they'll be safe. And this is, this is the classic way that artists like Ansel Adams did uh, market most of their prints, particularly toward the end of their career, and also gave them a chance to say, here's what I feel is important about my work. In contrast, an artist book is something that may be book-like in shape, is vaguely book-like, but is unique. And there's some way that the shape and form of the thing speaks to the art in it and makes a specific statement that's above and beyond the images that are involved. Both portfolios and artist books are expected to be handmade in some way, although that at there, of course, is a spectrum of handmade, and that doesn't mean you can't have studio assistants doing them, or in some cases, even businesses doing the printing and collating. Generally, the books that uh, that will that will be showing you the three that will be showing you uh, are very handmade affairs. This is a, another one of the pullouts in the uh, in the botanique, but it is presented uh, vertically. And a pair of daffodils. So as you'll see, the two daffodils are facing pages in the book. And one of the things about the Botanique book as we conceived it was that there would be a lot of different uh, substrates, different uh, surfaces of paper in it. So the different images, some of them would be on reflective paper, others would be on washi and much, much less of a, less of a um, bright distraction. I feel like, you know, with I have to, I have to say, I feel like with this peonies image and a couple of the other images that I've shown that I that I should that I should leak a very interesting prestigious use of that's going to happen with these images, but I can't. I'm not allowed to, so I just have to sit on it for now. But there will be there will be an announcement coming. This is a nice ranunculus on a dark background. Now I'm going to get into some photographs of the bits and pieces of putting together the botanic book. Uh, so this is the box that what Phyllis did with it was she took the box and basically customized it by gluing and inserts. 
and I would I should say here, Phyllis, if I'm saying anything that isn't really right on target as for how you constructed these, uh, please please do uh, come in. This is a shot of uh, what you would call imposition if it were a larger printing book of putting together the pieces uh, that go into it. Irene, no, in this case, the box was a, was a, was a supplier built box that Phyllis customized. It's possible to do it both, both ways round. I mean, it, it, you do have to be careful if you buy the box from a supplier that it's an archival box, you know, and, and it's going to impact the whole look of the thing. What you see here is the botanique book itself sitting inside the uh, modified box. And here, here is turning some pages. Note the, um, note, note that this is signed and numbered in a couple of different places. Here it is on the, on the, basically on the title page and along with a colophon above it that indicates what technology was used to make it. And as it says, there were, there are 25 copies of this and five artist proofs. Uh, Larry, I'm not a hundred, ah, thank you. Nine by 12 box. Here's the, uh, one of the pullouts. Hi, Deborah. Will you speak about best sizes? I can surely do so. I'm going to hold that, though, for the uh, discussion towards the end of it. I'm not sure there is one best size, honestly. One thing I was, I've been told a couple of times by art dealers, I mean, originally when I started out making prints, my you know, sort of internal temptation and desire was to go as big as possible. And sometimes that's been a good thing to do. But I was told a couple of times that by art dealers that, well, some of our most prosperous clients have apartments, let's say on the Ile de la Cité of Paris that are not very, very big and they like your work, but they, aren't, they don't have a place to put an eight foot wide print. Can you make something that will fit on a bookshelf, please? So there is, there is that issue, but the size should be commensurate with the, with what's in the image, of course. Sometimes I like to make my prints and my portfolios really small. So you really have to get up and hold them close. And other times it's like, let's stand back and marvel this thing. In some ways, really large pieces are better for public spaces than for intimate kinds of uh, places. As you'll see though, with the Kimono Koto portfolio, size of what it's printed on is a very, very interesting, plays a very interesting relationship to the final. The, this is a challenge for people who are interested in the subject. And what I've said to start with is this is taking the image beyond just a single print and, um, and coming up with something that's unique in form and design, you know, can you think of something to do that? Something that's something that's different. I, I see a question here of what papers did we use for printing? Botanique has about what, eight different papers in it, including archival vellum. Um, it has Unryu and, and, and uh, Kozo Washi, which are two different Washis. And it has, Moab's Slick Rock Pearl. I, I probably left a few off, but that's that's. Uh, oh, you that's pretty what... much you pretty much got it, Harold. I think it also has uh, some Entrada paper, you know, which is a matte paper. Just you know, doing the different kinds of papers is really interesting with the different kinds of uh, flowers and and things. So we'll, we'll, you'll get a better idea of this when we play the movie of the actual thing itself, uh, which will come up in the second part of uh, the presentation here. But what Phyllis also is going to be very happy to do is to uh, put links to some of these materials and suppliers in the box as people want them. What any binding issues from mixing papers, and I have to say, yes, absolutely. I think that binding um, something like Botanique is a, was and is a huge challenge to figure out how to do it. 
the po the post system that Phyllis came up with, and perhaps at some point uh, she'll say a little more about it, is um, a very functional, very pretty wonderful system. But in order to get it right, the she had to figure out the imposition of how the papers worked with each other and how they would fit in binding is a, it was it was an important part of that question you can't just go ahead and say anything i want to work will work next to something else and phyllis do you have anything to add to that um i think part of uh with botanique especially um some papers are thicker than others and so thin papers obviously um fold really easily but when you get into thick papers with coatings like the Slick Rock, Slick Rock Pearl, they're really hard to fold and fold nicely. And also when it gets really thick, it gets cumbersome when it gets to the binding. So opening it up makes it harder. So you have to sort of, you know, balance that with how many prints you have, the thickness and things like that. Yes. I mean, also what you really do want to think about is that if this is something that people are going to handle, and you want it to be handled. I want it to be handled. I don't want it to sit in the box and never be opened. Um, thick and thin and how they contrast, you don't want it to tear. So, I mean, sure, it should be carefully handed, uh, handled. I think we made the point of that with Botanique by shipping a pair of white gloves in the box with it. But you also want to do a prototype to make sure that it uh, moves smoothly. So I never really see my work until it's printed. Portfolios and artist books are a great way to start doing that. Uh, I'm going to move on to the pieces of the a modern pilgrimage along the Kimono Kodo. This is these are the mountains in the key peninsula of Japan, and this is actually this is a the moat of the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. Try to I tried to make a very meditative set of images here that spoke to some of the history, the length of history that people have been walking the Kamanakoto, these tree branch roots in a temple garden in Kyoto, which is thousands of years, I mean, literally. So, but at the same time, this is a place that has modernity about it. So I didn't just stick to images that were actually along the Kimono Koto itself. I used images from, from Japan generally. This is the old fashioned water wheel and rice field up there is, is, is a town on the Kimono Koto, Takahara, the high fields. And this was early one morning I got out, there was fog down in the valley, it's still cold. And this is Nachi at the end of the Kamanakoto on the Inland Sea. And I sort of thought it looked like Shangri-La. So as I processed the image, I made it that way. A dragon guarding one of the temples along the trail and temple flags with uh, special attention to getting to motion on the, on the left to use a long exposure. And I panned the camera a bit. And another panoramic view of the, the high spot on the Kimono Kodo Trail called the View of 10,000 Peaks. So monochromatic visions is a relatively conventional portfolio of 12 uh, print, black and white prints as the name implies. And here are the 12 black and white prints that go into the image, you'll see how these fit together in the next part of this presentation. There's a, combina a, a combination here really of images from the American West wilderness and also uh, images that are like this macro. And then as you'll see, there's some kind of uh, machinery images involved also. I tried to make the images visually cohesive, even though the, there's no theme like with Kimono Kodo or Botanique that combines these. This is more like, here's, here's my black and white practice at the time that I, that I made this portfolio, which was I think uh, maybe four years ago. 
and here's here's what here's how I believe black and white should look. So this is a something that a uh, I heard as a young photographer when I showed a portfolio, obviously with more than twelve images in it, to a to a famous art director, and. Um, the, the gentleman who at that time was the art director for Life magazine. And he said to me, Harold, if you can't say it in 12 photos, you really can't say it at all. And he's right. It's very, very hard though. So the, the object should be when you edit to make every piece, every piece in it, have, if you have only 12 photos or eight photos or whatever it is, Every piece has to carry a weight, has to be significant. There has to be a reason you put it in there. Okay, here's the discount code for Creative Garden Photography at the publisher's website. And here's the discount code for Creative Black and White at the publisher's website. We'll show this information again as we get further along here, but here's some of how to contact me. And here's a nice question slide. And I'm going to stop this, um, let's see, presentation. And did, uh. you, uh, <laughs> did you roll the movies, please? Absolutely. Well, I'm going to start with uh, Joshua Holko, who is an Arctic photographer with the Flint portfolio. Correct, Harold? Correct. Something that comes up from time to time, in fact, more often quite a, quite a lot, for, is what do you do with all your prints? How do you display them? How do you show them? And how do you share them? So I want to share with you something that's, that's just come on the market. It's new. It's fantastic. It's a product by Moab called a Flint Portfolio. Uh, it's a hard cover solution that comes in a number of different sizes. And inside here, you can have your original fine art prints uh, displayed without having to have them covered in plastic or inside individual sleeves but in, in this way you can fully appreciate the surface texture of the paper. This is the first time I've seen a solution that really elegantly combines prints together in a lay flat folio where you have a single uh, nearly invisible plastic strip on the back side of the print so when you're looking at the image on the right hand side it's completely clear there's nothing, no binding holes or anything like that to get in the way of the print, which means you can, if you wish, print almost right to the very edge of the paper. Uh, this is a beautifully elegant way to display prints for presentation. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at a 13 by nine example that's printed uh, on Somerset Museum rag paper, which is a 300 GSM paper. Something that's really important to me uh, is maintain, maintaining the tactile feel of the paper with a solution such as this. Because I'm dealing with individual sheets of paper that are not inside plastic sleeves, I get to enjoy all that wonderful sensation of the soft velvety paper, uh, which helps give my images a very artistic feeling. And that's something that for me that's really, really important. I don't want to have a level of plastic barrier uh, between the viewer and the print. So I, I enjoy this solution very much. If a print was ever to be damaged, uh, for, for any reason, I can take the print out and uh, simply replace that one page um, if, if required. So just very versatile, wonderful way to display prints and be able to share your work, your finished work, uh, with family, friends and uh, clients or whatever the case may be uh, for you. Thanks, Phyllis. That's great. There you go. So let's go ahead to uh, some more movies.
I thought that was really nice. Oh, thank you. And Deborah has the question, do some papers hold up better than others for this type of handling? Uh, absolutely. Uh, matte papers and, you know, thinner papers are going to take this handling a lot harder. They're going to get, um, you know, marked up if you have something with a coating on it that's like a, a photo type paper, but that's harder to fold. Um, that also, that holds up a lot better for handling. Uh, Elizabeth wants to know, do we mostly print one-sided? Uh, mostly, yes. Um, except you'll see in the uh, Kumano Koto portfolio, there's a uh, pamphlet that comes with it, and that's actually printed double-sided. Moab does offer a few papers that are double-sided, so you can, you know, very carefully have to turn around and put it back in the printer and get it just right, and uh, and it works. Um, Harold, Harold yeah. wants to know: Is this double-sided printing? So. The, the, the answer there is it's mostly back to back, not double sided. Right. For the botanique, it's kind of, you have to think backwards a little bit because you're using screw posts, you know, that screw into where, you know, they make the binding. So actually what that is, is a piece of paper with two prints on it, correct? And then you fold it in half in the middle so that the two prints are showing on both sides after you folded it, right? And then the a folded part, you know, where the fold is, that actually goes on the outside where your hand would touch it and the loose edges goes where the binding is. Does that make sense, Harold? Completely to me, but yeah. some of these things, you have to see it to fully understand it. So that's part of the point of the movies. Right. Also, yeah. Post-pandemic, yeah. post anyone want to visit here? We'll show you. We're happy to show you. Absolutely. Come on over and see, see us in all our craziness. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Gabrielle would like to know what kind of paper. Uh, there was uh, uh, Moab Unrayu Washi. There was Kozo Washi. These are all Moab papers because Harold is sponsored by Moab. Um, slick, like Slick Rock Pearl. I can never say that right. Slick Rock Pearl. And uh, also some, I believe, either Somerset or Entrada. I can't remember. Phyllis, when you get a yeah. chance, maybe you want to throw the Moab link into the Absolutely. Uh, I, I see a question from Irene there. Uh, uh, and thanks for all the kind words, yeah, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, have I, yes, incorporating text is very important to me. I probably wouldn't do either a portfolio or a book without some text explaining why I did it and things about it. Each of the three portfolios we're showing have fairly substantial text, textual elements, both more general about why I did this, what it's about, and also explanations of particular uh, uh, images where they were more about them. That's perhaps clearest in the Kamonokoto portfolio where there's really a separate pamphlet or a little book that comes with it to explain it. But but it's true with Botanique and there's a there's poetry that I wrote in there among other things that ode to a peony. And there are various essays about flowers in it. So yeah, the words are important and that's probably true for more than half of the artist's books that we've seen generally, often they're books. So they have art, but they also have words. Oh, um, there was a question about the printer we use. We have an Epson 9900. It's a, uh, gosh, how wide is it, Harold? It's a 44 inch wide printer. It's in what used to be our dining room. It is now the printing room. And um, yeah, it's wonderful. It handles up to 44 inch wide rolls. It'll handle most thicknesses, like not too thick. I mean, I have never put a board through it, but um, it's, it's pretty, it's an industrial printer. So, um, and, and it has lots ahead. of color. Oh, I was just gonna say has lots of colors too, which is really wonder, wonderful. And Deborah uh, wants to know, what do we use to design this? Mostly this is in design. Right, in design, actually, you know, to start, we will pull out a good old pencil and paper and just sort of put a mess of like, you know, just pieces of uh, regular old blank paper on the table and just start drawing. That's Something like what Phyllis just described is the only way you can really do imposition when it becomes complicated, because basically you need to look at the elements as a schematic kind of and say, how are they going to fit together? How are you going to have to print what, where? The, the, it, it becomes really very complicated very fast. Right. Oh, and to um, trim the pages, um, 
I have a, a mat, obviously, X-Acto knife. That's, that's my favorite tool. It's sharp and be very careful. I have cut myself badly with them uh, from time to time when I'm not paying attention. And very zen, you have to be very quiet. X-Acto knife, uh, metal rulers. If you're going to be cutting with some kind of a knife, I really recommend a metal ruler because plastic uh, will get cut by the knife and then you won't have a nice straight edge. So... That, that's one thing I really recommend. Um, Ira with, wants to know whether pages are glued and almost almost never would be the short answer. The collateral material like the boxes use archival glues, but not the, not the pages themselves. Correct. And oh, one thing I, I definitely in the Botanique box, it came from, um, I have the link for you. It's like uh, century. It's a century box. And they put this really annoying little silver sticker saying century boxes in the uh, sort of on one of the sides, you know, on the uh, back room. And, it, and I was like, I don't want that in there. So I, it took me a long time. I had to get what, what eventually loosened the glue so I could get it out of there without ripping the paper, which was horrible, a uh, hairdryer. I used a hairdryer on it, warmed it up, and it warmed up the glue so I could ease it off very gently. Yeah. So anyhow, it's just stuff like that. So Chris, um, Chris suggests that only photographers care about technical specs, so why put it in? And I, I think that's basically right. Uh, it's going to depend on the kind of material. I mean, in my in my book books, you know, like creative garden photography or creative black and white, I do tend to put in exposure data for every image, or at least most of them, because photographers do care about that and they should care about it. Uh, for the most part, the uh, these are not aimed at hardcore photographers or perhaps actually some of my collectors of these projects, like the uh, recent monochromatic visions copy that we sold was to a really accomplished photographer. So sometimes they, but I'm, I'm not really going to put f-stops in there. I mean, that's probably not, not what I want. I'm going to want to include. And if I am going to include any kind of really detailed photo information, I do it in a sort of appendix kind of way so that it's not just like a integral part of something where people are supposed to be transported to another world and another plane of serenity. I don't want them saying, okay, here's the camera model he took it with. Well, who really cares? So yeah, Chris, that's exactly right. Um, Irene, yes, we've had problems with warping of pages. Part of what you have to do there is press things after you do it. Um, Right, especially uh, botanique, that one, you know, after before binding, and you do all the folding. And then some of those pages are really thick, like the uh, slick rock pearl is really thick. So and, and LaSalle, we use LaSalle in it too. That's a very thick paper. It's like 300 GSM. So it's really, it's almost approaching, what do you think? Um, sort of like a I don't board, know, almost. board, a board yeah. almost. Yeah. And so I, you know, when I'm folding them uh, to fold it, I use, uh, you know, librarian and bookbinder scoring tools. The, uh, they're made out of, they originally made out of bone, but you get plastic ones now. I prefer plastic personally, just because I don't like bone, but, um, but for ethical reasons. But anyhow, um, yeah, so you score with those, you can fold with them and, uh, and then um, very gently pat it down. But then in order to make it go flat, because these are coming off of uh, paper rolls that are going through the printer, you know, so it's got that nice rolled, you know, so shape because it's coming off the roll, we have to make it flat. So there I am with every single hard book in the, you know, heavy book in the house that we have, the biggest ones, and I'm putting them all underneath. <laughs> All these books are all over the place with everything uh, holding it down. So they, they press for like, you know, a week. But anyhow. If you had something like a dye sublimation a printer, which is even more expensive than the kinds of printers that we're talking about a lot more, you could really print on all kinds of things. You print on anything. You could print on a stone. You can print on metal. You can print on plastic. You could perhaps use one of those to create a really unique kind of book, which would be fun, which leads me to uh, Gabriel Nunez's uh, excellent question. Is there an affordable printer for someone just uh, starting out? Unfortunately, I'm not that up on printer models to be able to recommend you a specific model, but I think any basic Epson or Canon that is beyond the uh, 
you, you know, that is intended for the purpose of making art prints would probably be a good choice. You, you, that sound right to you, Phyllis? Yeah, I think so, because with the Epsons and the Canons, you're going to get more inks, um, which is really important for tonal range, you know, dynamic range. So you, you get, you know, that extra 10% in your prints compared to something that's just going to give you like a, a CMYK, a cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, um, you know. Yeah, exactly. And, there, and there's some recommendations going into the comment right. box for an Epson P700 or P800 and the Canon Pro 10. The Pro 10 Canon's a good machine. It's not that expensive, and I'm sure. Right. Uh, and, and the Pixma is, is really nice. Um, you know, we did some black and white portfolios for Canon on a Pixma that they, you know, that they wanted to what, test. What, you're looking at something like what five to eight hundred dollars here. I believe so. I'm, I'm, I'm not price sure. Price range. Well, I just gave it. I'm not sure. Don't. don't I, I'm really uh, don't don't quote don't, us. Don't hold it on that. And understand also that uh, these things, at whatever level you get them at, are priced on the infamous razor blade model, where what really is expensive is not the initial purchase cost, but the ongoing expense of inks, cutting blades. Um, <laughs> Uh, ink waste ink tanks. I mean, so running them, running them is expensive per print. You know, there. You, you, if you were in a sane world, it would be like a car. You'd look at uh, TO, TCO total cost of ownership, not the initial, not the initial purchase price so much. I mean, I think it's fair to say that maintaining our printer is a labor of love, basically. Not to mention the recurring kerosene purchase. There you go, Ira. Explain kerosene, please. I'm sure. I'm sure you <laughs> meant. I think he's joking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the kerosene purchase to keep the heater and the light going while we're uh, running the printer because our electricity is blowing. Well, it, no. it is true. It is true that TG80 <laughs> always tells us we use more electricity than comparable houses our size around not, us. Yeah, and that's not, hardly a shock. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. We have six people stuffed in our house too. And they're all, you know, everybody's using like Zoom classes constantly on their laptops, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to sell the kerosene. Okay. <laughs> Phyllis, you want to ro roll monochromatic visions before we sure. get any sillier? <laughs> sure, I can get that rolling here. I have some questions about, well, I see a bunch of questions. Um, great questions. Great questions. Yeah, with the monochromatic visions, um, in the early in the early parts of the edition, I titled and signed each print 
later on I just signed it and I guess I'm going to continue to just sign it and they, these are signed by hand. What I use to sign them is a Pigma 03 ar archival ink pen. Um, so the archival part of it's important, but it's kind of like a, just a, you know, a marker pen in 03. Um, thanks. Um, Thanks for the kind words, guys. Do I have a stamp for my signature? No, but as you'll see, I do have an ink pen. Right, Phyllis? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I would I would want to sign by hand something like this, particularly, you know, when it's it's part of the value of something really is, to, is that I, I sometimes with individual print sales, the request I've had is don't sign the front of it. And then generally I, I do a couple of, uh, of studio labels with my signature on it. It's uh, it's it's appropriate, really. You want to roll Kamanakoto, or are there any? Or uh, there's a bill says about the cost of ink. Yeah, it's fifty eight uh, a tank and seven. Yeah, it it's like ink is ink is expensive. And it's what they're really selling. I mean, you know, in right. some level with their business model, they could almost give the printers away. Right. I, every time we have to, we run through a set of ink, I and I see the pricing on it, I shudder. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And then there's some inks you use more than others, so you buy. You know, that that's one thing I do. It's like it's like we use like um, light black a lot because the Epson 9900 uses that for a lot for toning and tonal ranges, even with the coloring. And so you go through a heck of a lot of light black and light, light black. So I'll get the bigger cartridge for that. But then, you know, Harold's uh, photos do use the green and the orange, which are really unusual colors. Well, you don't go through as much of that as fast. So I, you know, so we buy the smaller, the 150 milliliter for that. So, you know, it's just how much you use when but Phyllis, box. there's a question on the monochromatic visions box. Ah, that box is from, um, I've got the link for it. It's from a place called Print Files. It's a, uh, they have all sorts of portfolio boxes, really interesting ones, landscape ones, horizontal ones, different sizes. It's a, you know, 13 by 19 uh, portfolio. So I'll get that link in there. And shall I run the Kamano Kodo? Absolutely. Okay, here we go.
Thanks, Phyllis. Those, sure. those are really great movies. I really like them. Um, so let's see. Gabriel wants to know how much bigger should the box be than the size of the prints? From my viewpoint, that's really, it has a, a, a question. It's a good question that has both aesthetic and, um, and, and practical issues. You know, since this may be carried around or transferred or mailed or something, you don't you don't want it to be so much bigger than the prints that um, that it's going to slide around and get dinged or damaged. Um, well, also um, boxes like say the one for the uh, botanique, since we uh, spec'd it, you know, we figured it out that it was going to be a nine by twelve prints. The box, you know, you order it for nine by 12, but the box itself, they actually built that in. So the box itself is actually nine and an eighth by nine and an eighth or something like that. So there's just a little bit of play there so that you can, you know, your nine by 12 fit, uh, prints will fit into the box. So um, so they do allow that that play in there. I mean, you could be really careful about the these eighths of an inch is add up with eighths or whatever thing. or sixteenths or whatever they are. I don't know. And, but when people open it up, open the box up and look at what's in there, they want to feel that everything fits just right. It's sort of and and it makes sense and it's cozy and it's nice and it's a good tactile and visual experience. Um, uh, Larry would like to know uh, accordion fold. Yes, for the. Um, uh, Kamado Kodo. It was one 16 and a half foot long piece of Kozo that was uh, folded. Yes. And what Phyllis is not exactly saying there too, is that printing something 16 and a half feet long is something of a technical feat. Right, because the uh, Epson 9900, which is what we're using, uh, Max will do 10 feet. So the trick was figuring it out. How do you manage to get, you know, fool the printer into printing a 16 and a half foot long piece of paper when its max is, is 10 feet. So what we ended up doing, it took a lot, lot of uh, trial and error because with uh, paper on a roll, the uh, printer itself, uh, you know, uh, reverses and forwards and backwards it to get it in the right position to get printing. And so what we did was uh, you can tell it to um, advance but not cut. So that's what we did. And then we had separate, um, you know, basically files with each piece of the uh, portfolio and then, and told it exactly how much to advance, how much to put in. And then, um, and then we would make it through the entire um, portfolio using, I think it was four or five different files and, uh, and then finally end up with the whole thing. But then it, of course it had to be cut out and folded too. So there you go. That's kind of a little bit of what we did. Uh, Mark wants to know about face-to-face -face for ink transfer or smearing. Uh, I, I'd say no, but be mindful that prints need time to cure. Correct. At least the, 24 hours. Yeah. Well, the, the manufacturer specs tend to say less than that, like a couple of hours, but we, we, we go longer, a couple of days, right? basically. Um, but once they're fixed, they're fixed. Right. Um, the in the Kamano Kodo, the outer wrapper that the big wrapper that you know encloses the portfolio itself, that is a uh, I think it's a Hannah Mule watercolor paper. It's really difficult to print on, and it's um, it doesn't handle the ink really well. So what we did end up doing was we sprayed that with uh, Moab's Desert Varnish um, in order to preserve it so that it wouldn't um, smear or have uh, little flakes come off. So I guess the answer there is that sometimes we do spray with a varnish. Right, right. But that wouldn't be my preference. And and it's not something we've done that much. And varnish, uh, just so you know, folks, is really nasty stuff in the sense it's got solvents in it. At least it smells horrible. So I'm always out on our front porch. Um, you know, I have them all lined up out on front porch on craft paper. And I'm just sort of spraying as fast as I can. And then I run inside and let it sit for an hour and then run out and spray again. So ideally, you know. one ought to be using a respirator with it, in fact. Right. And so I hold my breath on the porch and well, run back. Now, and forth. now these these <laughs> these days we we all have plenty of experience with masks, right? But uh, anyhow, on we go. <laughs> uh, Ira wants to know whether you have your own chop, Phyllis. I think. I no. Think that's, <laughs> no, I do not. No, no. Only Harold has an Incan, 
And Irene, Irene would like to know any issues with folding causing cracking of the photo, photo printed across the fold. Yes, that is an issue, especially again with the wrapper on the Kamano Koto portfolio. That's one big landscape print. And um, yes, it's folded. You know, I kind of hate to do that. I'm, I'm folding, you know, we're folding Harold's prints, but it's part of the sort of the, the wonderful package. So, um, you know, Harold was okay with that. And we had quite a lot of discussion and debate about that, that wrapper. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it all came out beautifully, but it wasn't so clear in the beginning that we were going to go in that direction with it. There is a, a, a question or thought when you're doing something like this and designing it, how are you going to make a cohesive piece? And the wrapper here was part of what, how we did it with the with the uh, whole Kabanakoto portfolio, but not uh, not something we did lightly, and I don't think something we do very often, except in special circumstances that warranted it. Right. Um, let's see. Chris has a question, and uh, can you share any comments about mixing black and white with color images in a single portfolio, and landscape and portrait orientation in same or facing pages? Yeah, well, that's I mean, difficult sometimes, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these things come up with book books too. The uh, they're two different issues, and they, these 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 speak to the technicalities of graphic design to some extent. And of course, it all is going to depend upon your your aesthetic. The landscape and portrait isn't really so hard. I mean, you often will have a a book, uh, you know, which which let me let me pull out an example that has a. Uh, that, that has a horizontal on one page and a vertical on the other. It just so happened. I just opened to one. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, uh, same pictures from the Kimono Koto. See, I get to reuse my stuff. That can work if it's designed nicely and, and without a real problem. The color and the black and white, I would have hesitancy about. It's going to be an unusual a situation where you have a, a a spread basically with both with color on one side and black and white on the other and both work might work for a you know a science textbook that's fine but for a book which is about art and art photography maybe not so much unless you have a specific statement that you are trying to make and then okay anybody who has a, sp a specific statement to make please go to town uh I well, have a question of a go ahead, fellas. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to add to that. Um, you know, when you're creating a portfolio like this, you're really creating a narrative. You're, you're some kind of a story that you're telling from start to finish. So you have to kind of think about that. And what we'll do sometimes, I mean, they're not great images, obviously, great, great prints, but we'll make PDFs of Harold's um, uh, photos that we may want to include in a portfolio. And then just print them up on our regular old, you know, business brother CMYK printer. They're, they're not great, but it gives the basic idea. And then we just take them and literally one per page, you go take them on the table or put them on the floor and then just start playing with how they go and where, where, you know, how does the narrative work and where should they be placed and how do things go along? So that that's one thing we use, you know. It's like playing with a deck of cards. I mean, literally, sort of. And Phyllis is very right to use the word narrative, and because you are telling a story, and some of the principles of uh, narrative structure apply. You always want to start before a minor a crisis in a narrative. So there's a kind of graph you do, and so you want to you 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 want to get people's interest pretty quickly. Why is this interesting? And you want to make sure to save your best for last. You want to end with a bang. Um, Greg's asking about with the thirteen by nineteen prints. What are the border dimensions? Lovely to see the consistency as the pages flipped. Um, I'd say um, you know it's not more border is better, but um, I always feel like images need room to breathe on a page so sometimes you can have a very big piece of paper and the uh, photo can be quite actually surprisingly small in the middle if it depends on the image you can play with that it's it's really interesting but yes in a portfolio um unless you have like um in botanique the, uh, there are some square images that we're facing on a page and those obviously they're the same size, you know, you want to have consistency so that 
the, you know, people who are looking at the book, their eyes not hopping around or they're not getting surprised, like, or it makes them stop kind of thing or it makes them hiccup. So, um, you know, you can play with margins and, and, you know, remember that, you know, give a photo enough room to breathe on the page. What's really a mistake yeah. is to get caught up in the cost of paper. In other words, oh my gosh, I've paid for this expensive sheet of paper. I know by it's gum. hard though. You know, it's I know so it hard. is hard. By gum, I'm going to print to the edge of it. And that's a mistake because with, for somebody who's handling it or even once it's framed, the way it, the paper and margins relate to each other is such an important part of the graphic design of a print that you just don't want to think too hard about that. Right. And you can also, you know, just not use the special paper that you have to print on. You could even, you know, say you have eight and a half inch paper or nine by 12 or something. You can just play with it on like a, a scanner and a copy machine to see what looks good for you before you actually go for it and print on a, an, you know, an expensive piece of paper. So you can play with things on, on cheaper papers first, but I'm a great one using our, you know, just, we have a, you know, a, a, a printer that also does scans at specific sizes and I'll just play with it there on stupid eight and a half by 11 paper until I feel like it looks good. You know, and then I'll ask Harold what he thinks and he'll say, oh, 10% smaller or, or, you know, whatever his, his input is because, you know, he's the guy. Well, you know, what I would say is that this is something that experience, experience will really get you to the right place. You, got, you have to do a lot of it. And, right. And, you know, certainly our, our um, imposition of the image on the printed page has got better as we've made lots and lots of prints, really. Um, and, Gabrielle wants to know, are metallic papers okay for fine art prints? Absolutely, as far as I'm concerned. What about you, Harold? I have no problem with them. Look, and you know, you could print a vulgar, terrible image on the best fine art paper in the world, and you could uh, print a beautiful image on newsprint. It might not last forever, but it'd still be. I mean, I mean, it. The 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 answer here is it all depends, and you know, really, the only rule is there are no rules. But but uh, I like metallic paper a lot, and I don't like it for every image. I mean, if I if I were going to say something to keep in mind, it's that the the materials need to match the image. So this is a little bit like form follows function. You want whatever image you're printing with to be in line with whatever you're printing it on. You don't want it to be totally dissonant. I mean, I don't want to print uh, a, 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 a vulgar red lipstick ad on a piece of a nice piece of washi unless the, that's the whole point of the thing. And then sometimes you can, uh, a, a, mix, a mismatch of substance, uh, of the substrate substance and the image itself makes some sense, but there has to be a real reason if you're gonna do something that's dissonant. So think in terms of dissonance and harmony, and are you a harmonic musician, which is what I sort of think of myself as, I like my pieces to have some serenity to them, or are you more interested in disharmony, you know, are you postmodern and you want to make a vulgar statement, well then maybe you do want to and you also want to tear them and burn them up a little too at the same time. I mean, the, the, one of the wonderful things about photography as an art form is, and printing photography as an art form, is how much room there is for so many different things. There's no really one way to do it. Before, before it goes totally into the history of the uh, chat box, I want to address Leonard's question about what camera equipment I use. So, you know, I use a variety of cameras, obviously, but my current a go-to camera is a Nikon D850. Uh, the vast majority of my work is done on a tripod in, uh, when, I, when I can, and that would generally mean when I'm not carrying it on my back, I like to use the Zeiss Otis lenses, but they're heavy glass. So I have, a, I have walking around Nikkor lenses that use when I'm traveling, which I hope to do again sometime soon. If you have specific gear questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Um, Let's see, there was a question from Irene about printing in segments and attaching with hinges. I see that. We've never I, done that. but I think it might, it might work just fine, but I think right. you want to be careful that the hinges are archival. Right. And, and you know, it depends on how 
long your your book and or portfolio is going to be. I mean, heralds are mostly what, you know, 10, 12, 14 images, something like that, Harold? No, we haven't really done anything any more than that. I no. would be hard put to want to really. And right. I mean, as as that slide I and and conversation with uh, uh, with John uh, put put it if you can't say it with more than twelve images, you can't say it. And so uh, I actually would even say if you can't say it with six images, you can't say it. So I tend to be I I like to edit lean. It's hard to do. Right. And, and George had a good comment. It is preferred to have a consistent print size and unified color space. That's correct. And and um, want to say something about like printing on specific papers, like the Moab papers or Canson papers, Hannah Mule, any of these papers, they, uh, for the printer that you have, they usually have an ICC profile that matches the paper. So that would give you the best um, ink distribution and uh, what all for that particular paper for your printer. So if you're printing on a specific paper, get the ICC profile installed and use it. And uh, Moab actually on their website has a whole um, uh, video about uh, ICC profiles, how to install them, how to use them, load them and all that. So there you go. Great. And let's see, Elizabeth wants to know, do you have a book covering or end paper source? Yes, it's, uh, you know, I just put in links up there, so, uh, down there somewhere, wherever it is. Uh, Talus is really wonderful for um, archival and book binding supplies. Also Gaylord Archival. They are actually a library, archival library supplies. And um, so they have everything library you could imagine with papers, um, boards, everything, you know, ink, um, glues, brushes, you name it. And uh, Larry's leaving for his vaccine. So Oh, and, congratulations, Larry. And yes. good for him. And hooray. Stay, and stay safe, safe everybody. everyone. Yes, absolutely. How many portfolios do you make at one time? Deborah, addition sizes, uh, you know, in the we, we, we were running a, a Kamanokoto and monochromatic vision at uh, 12 plus three or four artist proofs. The Botanique was a bigger edition size. You know, one at a time is the answer in terms of manu the manufacturing process, if you can call it manufacturing. Our um, own personal manufacturing. <laughs> <laughs> kitchen table manufacturing. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Robert wants to know, how do you mount large 24 by 36 or larger so the print doesn't wrinkle? Archival mat board or archival foam board? Well, I would, you know, we would never uh, mount a print to a board, you know, like, like glue it onto a board because that um, basically you can't get it off um, and it destroys the print. Or, or as what I think of as the value of the print. Yeah, I mean, our, mm. it's, it's a, a surprisingly controversial topic, but we don't dry mount and uh, archi on archival or otherwise, because as Phyllis says, you'll never get it off. And if you talk to real experts on this, um, uh, wonderful vintage photos that have been dry mounted uh, had their value cut considerably. Uh, but certainly we frame and have framed large prints and you don't need to mount them to do that you have need a, need a good framer oh right um if you want to do the framing yourself i you know i mean it's something i do we do sometimes but i hate it because it's so nitpicky and it's really hard to do i think um but anyhow the supplier we've used and i'll put it in the the chat box is frame destination they will, they have, uh, you know, cut, they'll do custom cuts and custom frames for anything. They also have, you know, stings that are standard size too. So I'll put that in there so you can um, um, see anything you need. And they have boards, backing, you know, uh, mats, you name it. And uh, Stephen recommends Moab's printing seminars, particularly those with Evan Parker. And I completely agree. Evan's, Evan's printing seminars are great. You might put up the Moab webinar link, Phyllis, when you oh, get okay. a chance. I'll find it. And um, Gabriel and Mark Miller both want to know about uh, enlargement software. 
Gabriel specifically gigapixel, Mark asks a more general question, a topic for a separate webinar, enlargement issues and management quality in printing. And yes, that is a topic for a separate webinar. Uh, sometimes I use gigapixel to blow my stuff up. It's a great program. I, I recommend it. It's a Topaz Labs program. Uh, the considering the considering that the cameras that I use and the size of the prints you've seen in these portfolios, they don't need blowing up. So, so it's so it's not so much an issue here. Anyhow, a, a big topic, but yes, if necessary, I I would use Topaz's uh, gigapixel to blow up smaller images. That's for for example when I photograph something with a low resolution camera that's typically what i'd use and it's astounding how much better the whole uh technology of software interpolation to enlarge things has become than it used to be but again a, a big topic to discuss and also software management for print consistency and all that kind of thing uh the the material that evan parker presents on the moab uh, uh webinars is, is quite good he knows what he's talking about i see a couple of questions related to marketing which isn't something that we haven't talked about much and we meant to mark miller very succinctly it says marketing of work question mark and then uh i saw earlier on a related question um are there preferred places to market our artist books and irene do you market your work through book arts distributors like tramp um yeah so the, the, these are these are great questions. With our three books, we started them as Kickstarter projects. So basically, we we um, we also did something else, which is that we we structured the edition so that the earlier uh, numbers in the edition were a lot less expensive than later on. So basically, via the Kickstarters initially to the people who know my work, we sold the enough to make the whole thing worthwhile. And so I, I wouldn't call that either a channel or um, or a marketing scheme, really. It was using uh, using the power of the internet to just go directly to people. The as as uh, Irene understands, there's a there is a channel for artist books, and if I and if and if someone was creating something that fit in with the material that tends to be accepted as artist books as a separate creation, yes, certainly I would uh, I would try to try to go that route. Um, what basically you have is with something like a portfolio is you you have an art product so if you have collectors then you work with them if you have art dealers or galleries you work with them i i'm you know i'm not sure there's a huge uh distinction wow that's quite a archival supplies list that you've put there um i was trying to think of everybody we've sourced from <laughs> 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 oh gosh, I, I'm I'm glad that most of these places are still in business, particularly a place like Talus, which is a very special supplier. The, I mean, in some ways, what you have here, I said a factory on the kitchen table, but that's that's really what it is. You're cre you're taking your original art and you're creating value from it that is something that is unique and different and has different kinds of art channels who are interested in it so it, it's a very special kind of thing and you know I, I if if the question is how you market yourself as an artist honestly that's beyond the scope of what i can do here but if if you are already somebody with an art public well then yeah you should take it into the channels talk to your art dealers and uh, see what you can do with it and and uh, do put up some videos showing your book so that people can see it. Astounding how many people find me because of that. So that's an important aspect of it. Uh, Connie says, feels, feels like this will be another book for you. Uh, well, you know, one of one of the things that uh, that uh, I, 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 I like doing is these webinars because they, they well, they, they uh, sort of, it, it's a little faster than doing a book. 
Uh, there's that market, I have a question about uh, how to market your work. There's that marketing fine art photography book, I forget the name of the author. Um, and it's not bad, it's really about people who wanna market themselves in what used to be things like street fairs, which isn't gonna help so much right now when there are no street art fairs. Um, and uh, Condi's mom is a bookbinder. How cool is that? There's so much in bookbinding itself. It's what a what a unique craft that is. Um, you know, I think Phyllis, you've learned a fair amount about bookbinding since we started doing this, right? The uh, absolutely, it's been a trial by fire. <laughs> 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 well, I particularly like the binding. I don't think any of our photography really showed it, but I particularly like the binding you had on the pamphlet that went with the uh, Kamanakoto portfolio because it's this Japanese, very deceptively simple binding. And it's really beautiful. It's elegant. I'm going to say thank you very much, everyone. And thank you for the kind words. The, uh, and I, uh, Thank you all very much. Please feel free to send us JPEGs or, or captures of your own art books or portfolios. I'd love to see what you're up to. Um, Irene, that goes for you, please, and everyone, of course. And uh, thank you very, very, very much. Bye for now. enjoyed this video and found it informative. Be creative and stay mighty.